Hi, welcome back to the Woodshop Nerdery. In this video, I continue the project build for my Stickley Highlands bookshelf. And specifically, I need to cut the square holes in the four upper slats per the design here. Here are the four upper slats and I need to make the square holes in these. I had milled these and steam bent them in an earlier video to flatten them out as much as possible because when I resawed these from a thicker board, the tension released and everything warped. I know that this is not the most exciting video, making holes in wood, but if you've been following the other videos in this project build series, you might want to stick around and see this one. Let's get started. I need to cut out the three holes in each of the four upper slats per the design of the Stickley Highlands bookshelf. I drew up some one-to-one -one templates and printed them out on my computer, then cut them out and added double stick tape to the back. Here are my four upper slats, so what I'll do is peel off the back of that tape stick it on here nice and square, then I'll take it over to the jigsaw and cut it out. I've got a practice piece here made out of plywood because I want to practice cutting out these squares before I attempt to cut out the squares on my expensive quarter sawn oak. While we're talking about double stick tape, I use carpet tape. The type on the left is much stronger. It's got a mesh weave embedded into the adhesive. Because it's so strong, it's great for making temporary jigs and so forth and so on. However, it's not so great if you plan on sawing through it with a jigsaw, circular saw, or bandsaw. The adhesive is just too gummy and it comes up the gullet to the blade and quickly starts to cause your blade to burn the wood. This tape, which is just a film of plastic with adhesive on both sides, is much better. It's plenty strong and it's easy to get on and easy to get off. Both of these tapes are available at home centers. They're not that hard to find. I'm setting up to use my jigsaw for the first time in a long time. In fact, the last time I used it, was on this project, which is a stylized version of the Beatles' Let It Be album art cover. I made this for the 2022 Makers Rock album art collaboration. I'll link to that video in the description. And when I used this jigsaw last, I had it set up on a Shopsmith power station. In this case, I've got it set up on my shop deputy. I also made this shop deputy in a video I'll link in the description. But using the jigsaw on the power station, the table was just too low for me. That's why when I made this unit, I made sure it was elevated off the ground a little more. So now at this height, I find it perfect to actually see the work, especially through my progressive lenses. The table saw is a little higher, but it's still a good compromise for height. So I'm really liking using this shop deputy. And I find that the power of the Shopsmith Mark V headstock is far superior to the motor that's in the power station. Now that I have this, I wouldn't go back to a power station for anything. I've got my practice board here. I'm going to get set up and start making some cuts. Not bad, there'll be some uh, cleanup work with a file, but that's to be expected. So I'm glad I worked up this practice board because I realized while making the cut that the workpiece will be too long in this direction. This is the size of the actual workpiece. I won't be able to make the cut like this, going that way because it'll hit the bar over here. So what I'll have to do is hang the workpiece off the table that way, cut the right hand side, pull it back, turn it, Cut forward, turn, cut forward, turn, cut forward, 
and I'll be back at my original square. I'm not too excited about having to pull backward in the cut and then turn, but I think that's gonna be better than drilling another hole and then stopping the machine halfway through each square, re-threading and going again. So that means I've got my holes drilled in the wrong spot here. So I'm gonna re-drill these holes in the correct starting location for this method and then give it a try. By the way, I'm using a Shopsmith jigsaw blade that came with my used unit. It's the .110 medium tooth blade and it's a PL-1417 and the part number here is 505668. Of course you can't go out and buy these new, um, but the pinless Olsen blades uh, work just fine in this as well. This is a universal number two skip tooth blade. It's quite thin and I found that it worked well on all the tight radius curves I needed for the Maker's Rock album art cover build. But in this case, I'm making straight lines. So the wider blade is gonna help me track better on those straight lines. That is a really good cut as far as I'm concerned. Of course, I'll have a little bit of cleanup to do here in the corner with a file and a little bit of sanding on the back, but that is a really great cut. You can tell by looking at the waste piece that uh, that is a really nice smooth cut in this white oak. And what impresses me even more about the quality of cut I get with this jigsaw is that this jigsaw was manufactured in the early 1980s, but it's based on a design going back all the way to the 1950s. In fact, if you look at one made in the 1950s, it'll look almost identical except it'll be green and it'll have an M emblem down here. This design is what's called a rigid arm scroll saw where this arm here doesn't move at all. There's simply a spring that helps the blade return upwards. So the blade is only powered from the bottom. Newer scroll saws will keep the blade under a constant tension using a set of parallel arms moving up and down, top and bottom. There's a bit of a misnomer with a scroll saw like this. People will often say that the blade is only powered on the downstroke. That's not true. The blade is powered up and down from the bottom on both strokes, but it's only powered from the bottom. There is no power on the top except for the spring. There's more to this topic and there's a lot better explanation of all this in Nick Engler's the Woodshop Companion Scroll Saw book, and a PDF of that book is available for purchase on his store. I'll leave you the link. I have a digital copy of all the Workshop Companion books and I reference them regularly. <laughs> I found clamping the workpiece flat in the vise like this is much better. I have much better visibility into the cut. And I also have much better visibility if I need to fine tune the alignment and squareness of the holes.
Okay, so here are my four upper slats with the square holes drilled. I believe the reason that Stickley calls this line of furniture Highlands is it's referring to the Scottish Highlands and paying homage to Scottish furniture designers like Charles Rene McIntosh. In some of McIntosh's chairs, you can see two slats in the back of the chair with uh, three holes each somewhere near the top. And this is very reminiscent of that. That's it for this video. I'll continue the project build in future videos, so please come back and check those out. Bye.